I'm Marty Stauffer. Wild animals have evolved a wide range of survival tactics. They must eat, and they must keep from being eaten. For predators, speed or stealth is essential, and it helps you have special equipment, sharp fangs or talons to catch and hold prey. But nature is not all tooth and claw. Many animals have survived by being slow and steady, and by having some unique feature that protects them from enemies. Porcupines may not seem very fast or alert, but they don't need to be. For countless generations, they've gone about their business, secure in the instinctive knowledge that few creatures will threaten them, and those not for long. Many others have also developed strange and remarkably successful strategies for dealing with predators. Such methods don't help the animal to gather food, but they do keep it from being fed upon. Let's take a closer look at these designs for defense. Nature's odds seem stacked in favor of the predator. It often has a choice of prey. Whereas the only choice its prey has, if it's lucky, is self-defense. Like other animals, the opossum's first option is to try to hide. But given the coyote's sense of smell, this tactic is of little use. Especially since the opossum can't run fast enough to hide very far away. Just as the second coyote senses that a meal is at hand, her mate appears to have lost his appetite. Most predators need the stimulation of resistance to incite them to kill, and the act of killing to induce them to eat. An inert body inspires little interest. But the possum is still breathing, and in fact, it's only plain dead, plain possum. Biding time until the threat of danger is passed. It's not just consciously putting on a good act, however. It actually goes into a state similar to shock, a condition known as thanatosis. The coyotes are fooled into searching for livelier prey. While gradually, as it senses that the coast is clear, the opossum comes out of its trance and goes about its steady, deliberate way. The hognose snake has the advantage of a passive, built-in defense called mimicry, which means that its markings resemble those of a more dangerous creature, its dreaded cousin, the rattlesnake. It capitalizes on this similarity by hissing and striking out. It can also inflate its body to larger than normal size, for which it's nicknamed the Puff Adder. But these acts of bluff backfire, for the snake has no fangs with which to back them up. Instead, its sudden movements make the badger all the more aggressive. An important part of the snake's defense strategy is to protect its most vulnerable part, its head, by tucking it under its coils. Only when the snake holds still does the badger seem to lose interest. Perhaps this is a cue for the hognose to try the last special effect in its bag of tricks. It too plays possum. The badger seems genuinely frustrated, but will this ruse really work? Unlike the opossum which curls up in a ball to safeguard its stomach, the hognose feigns death belly up protecting its head in the center of its coils. Animals that play dead often smell dead. The badger turns away in disgust.
Perhaps the hog-nosed snake and the opossum, even more than the cat, should be known as creatures that have nine lives. The Arizona coral snake exemplifies the defense phenomenon known as opossumatism, in which bright coloration warns a predator that potential prey is poisonous or otherwise unpleasant to eat. This grasshopper mouse may not look like much of a predator, but it's fiercely carnivorous, a match for tarantulas, scorpions, sometimes even coral snakes. Instead of playing dead like a hognose snake, the coral snake relies on blood, thrashing its body to confuse and distract its attackers. The coral snake is poisonous, but unlike the other poisonous snakes of North America, it has no hypodermic fangs with which to inject its toxins. It must fasten its short teeth into a victim and chew in order to release venom. Perhaps this is why it seems reluctant to bite. A lifetime is necessary to learn which defense tactics work best in which situations, and a lifetime in the wild is often very short. Though bluff will often repel an enemy, it has little effect on this tiger among mice. But as the battle grows more intense, at least this action does prevent the mouse from getting a firm grip on the snake. The coral snake succeeds in escaping temporarily. And the conflict comes to a standstill as the tired mouse goes off to find a more rewarding way to make a living. Camouflage coloring is a primary defense of the banded gecko. Survival depends in part on blending with the sandy soil of Arizona where it's found. But camouflage is no defense against the mouse's sense of smell. The gecko's survival depends more on instinctive behavior than on inherent coloration, and behavior calls first for escape. That is, if escape is possible from a creature as persistent as the grasshopper mouse. The gecko's tail looks appetizing, and is much easier to get hold of than was the coral snake. But with lizards, such as the gecko, the tail serves to draw attention away from more vital parts. And the tail is expendable. In fact, it is programmed to break off at a certain weak point. This contest has two winners. The gecko will live to regenerate a new tail. While the mouse is finally rewarded with a bit of dinner. On the windswept plains of eastern Colorado, there's little in the way of shelter or cover. Like the banded gecko, many creatures here depend on camouflage for protection. The color pattern of this sharp-tailed grouse mimics an eye-blurring blend of thin snow and native rock.
The grouse's plumage serves as an adaptive defense, not only against predators, but against the environment itself, a form of protection that all living creatures need. Densely overlapping feathers keep the bird warm. The hairy wisps on its feet act as snowshoes, and the scaly combs, which it grows on its toes in winter, function as tire chains to help it travel quickly over ice and snow. Among the many threats to these prairie birds, one of the swiftest and most deadly is the jeer falcon. When this keen-eyed predator takes to the air, the defense system of every small creature for miles around is immediately on the alert. Instinctive behavior is crucial. To remain undetected, a camouflaged creature must be on the right colored background, and it must keep still. From high in the air, the jeer falcon watches for the slightest movement below. One sharp-tailed grouse nestles down, almost motionless. But for its companion, panic proves fatal. Behavior plays an extremely important role in defense, especially in higher animals. Nature issues the basic equipment, camouflage for instance, but survival ultimately depends on how the individual creature responds to danger. Good luck helps, but constant alertness and cool head are essential. It's not the predator that's favored by nature, but the qualities of wise instinct and experience. Among lower forms of life, behavior is less critical. Each of these caterpillars, with their false eye spots and cryptic colors, their bristling spines and unappetizing shapes, can be found within a single forest in Ohio evidence of nature's infinite variation. <laughs> like them, this white tussock moth caterpillar is a walking, wriggling advertisement that predators should dine elsewhere. It comes equipped with sharp spines that can severely irritate or puncture internal membranes. These bristles are obviously unpleasant to the tree frog. Yet, what predator can withstand repeated temptation? This defense fails both prey and predator. The frog ate the caterpillar anyway, then later died. Nature is not always perfect. Evolution is always in a state of flux, which makes a foolproof defense system impossible. Better designs for defense simply create better predators. 
But one design that comes close to working consistently is the porcupine's armor of super bristles. A baby porcupine is armed at birth with more than 30,000 of these needle-sharp quills covering most of the upper parts of its body. No wonder mother and baby can go about their foraging so placidly. Few predators have learned how to get around these quills. Each quill is controlled by a single muscle. When the porcupine is at ease, the quills lie hidden among long, sensitive guard hairs. But a disturbed animal can erect them at will. Under the microscope, the quills are seen to be modified hairs. Their tips are covered with tiny, backward-curving barbs. And with a waxy substance that may aid penetration. From tail to head, this mild-mannered creature is a completely armored pincushion. Be the unsuspecting animal that stumbles into it. The instant the guard hairs are touched, the porcupine reacts by swatting its tail. Porcupine cannot throw its quills, but they're so loosely embedded in the skin that innocent bystanders, as well as nosy intruders, may suffer the consequences. The raccoon, with its clever forepaws, has an easier time than most. It can remove the quills, but other animals are not so lucky. They may starve unable to eat with a mouthful of quills, or they may die as a quill works its way into a vital organ. Yet it's interesting that the quills contain an antibiotic substance that seems to prevent infection where they penetrate. In evolving this elaborate and specialized defense system, the porcupine is easily compensated for its slowness and lack of cunning. I was exploring one day in early spring when I spotted what turned out to be a recently shed mule deer antler. In fact, it was so freshly shed that it was still moist with blood. I thought the buck that had dropped it must be somewhere nearby. I found him grazing on early spring grass, already taking in the nutrients he would need to grow a new set of antlers. The fresh socket was still red and wet. The other socket was dry. Antlers are often shed several days apart. In a few weeks, these sockets will be covered with a layer of fuzzy velvet, which will then begin to bulge and grow. During the next few months, I returned several times and filmed the regrowth of his antlers. The rounded button stage of spring develops at an incredible rate. This velvet is one of the fastest growing tissues known, and has even been studied in relation to human cancer, a disease which also has fast growing cells. Maybe someday, a deer's antlers will help us to save lives. Soon, the velvety spikes of summer will fork into the gleaming tines he polishes in preparation for autumn's battles. The word defense has many meanings, and applies within a species as well as between species. The buck's limp tells me that he's already been hard at work defending his territory and harem, not against predators, 
against rivals. But there's no rest for the weary. A larger buck with larger antlers hangs out on the edge of the herd, presenting a constant challenge. Once again, a fight is inevitable. Once and for all, the smaller buck seems determined to evict the intruder. Someday, this young buck will have to face the same challenge. Nature's lesson is that bigger is not necessarily better. What counts is the spirit and determination to fight and to survive. Some animals wear their protection almost passively, as an automatic life insurance policy they hardly even need to think about. Others must choose how far to carry their threat displays before resorting to more extreme tactics. None of these creatures has developed the deadly weapons or complex intelligence that we associate with their more highly developed predators. But all of them have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, and will no doubt continue for many more, adding to nature's variety with their unique designs for defense. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America. <laughs>